Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They go together like peanut butter, jelly, and mountains of cocaine. In the immortal words of Nickelback, Look at this photograph! Wait, hold on, that's not it. We all just wanna be big rock stars. And that's an understandable sentiment. Being a rock star is basically being a god. You're an archetype, a cultural icon, an American hero. Unless you're British. Which, way too many of them are, actually, uh, but that doesn't count. British people aren't real. Wake up, sheeple. All any young boy with greasy hair and a nose ring wanted in the latter half of the 20th century was to grab a guitar and provocatively undulate at a million cheering fans who all either wanted to be you, fuck you, or some combination of the two. And of course they wanted that. It's the perfect encapsulation of the American dream. You start off as a dirty, little, poor, little, disgusting, little, absolute waste of society. You're struggling with the very prominent and untreated mental health issues that are the backbone of this country. Maybe your daddy smacks your little hiney every once in a while, burns you with a lit cigar when you forget to set the table, you know, kid stuff. And then one day you're kicking a can down the road and come across a dusty old guitar or like a 2 by 4 with strings on it or some shit, and through sheer power of will and hairspray, you become rich and famous, a legend even. You can do whatever you want, say whatever you want, fuck whatever you want, engage in unprecedented levels of debauchery. You can be an absolute piece of irradiated human garbage, and if you just keep playing that guitar good enough and wear enough eye makeup, Everyone's still gonna love you no matter what. And obviously, this kind of life creates some very respectable and well-adjusted members of society. NOT! These men were insane. There's no other way to put it. Like, in both the metaphorical and literal sense, I don't think a single one of them didn't have mental health issues. I don't know how any normal person could stay sane in that situation. I mean, you're constantly being watched, anything you do is headline news, you're moving from city to city every night, you're constantly high as Neil Armstrong's balls on July 20th, 1969 on every substance known to man. So when you take a guy who is basically treated as a god, you add mountains of cash, a pinch of mental illness, and a heaping helping of drug abuse, you get some of the weird Weirdest, wackiest, ear splittingest, bong hittingest, bat eatingest, drug fiendiest, near missingest, airplane pissiest, car crashiest, hotel smashiest stories you can find. So without any further ado, let's talk about some really rambunctious, rabble rousing rockers ruining rooms, ravaging wombs, and raiding tombs. And such. You may have heard that Van Halen had a clause in their contract stating that there must be a bowl of M&Ms backstage with absolutely no brown ones in it, or the venue would forfeit all proceeds for the show. Not a single brown M&M allowed in that bowl. Not, no sir, not a smidgen. Not a speck. You may have also heard that if they actually found a brown M&M in there, they would just go absolutely apeshit on their dressing room and kick holes in the walls and break stuff and shit and fart and cry and cum. But listen, all that stuff, all those slanderous rumors, okay, they are all... Totally true, they did absolutely do all of that. But what you may not know is just why they made such a ridiculous request. Allergies? Candy-based racism? The product of an overinflated narcissistic ego? Well, yeah, I guess on that one a little bit, but uh, mostly it was to make sure that the venue had fully and thoroughly read their contract with the band. You see, Van Halen had one of, if not the biggest and most elaborate stage setups of any band playing at the time. A normal stadium band of a similar popularity had at most three 18-wheelers full of stuff for their performance. Van Halen had nine. They had ramps and mini stages, a shit ton of speakers, a live rhinoceros probably. I mean seriously though, like a shit ton of speakers. I mean, look at those. Do those all work? Are they just like decor? How do these men hear? In addition to everything on and backstage, the band also used 890 stage lights. The big ones. You know the ones, those big old thick chonky boys. It's like, lose some weight, dog. Damn, if you're called a light, then why are you so damn heavy, bruh? All these lights combined weighed somewhere between a ton and a fuck ton. And a fuck ton of lights need a fuck ton of strong, handsome, chadley rafters to hang on without the entire ceiling collapsing like the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. And obviously, because of the sheer size and complexity of the setup, Van Halen had one of the longest and most in-depth contracts with their venues of any band ever. It was so long that lead singer for the band, David Lee Roth, said that it read like the Chinese Yellow Pages. Which, uh, is that racist? You know, like, 
yellow, you know, like. The venue had to make sure the floors were sturdy, the girders were girty, and the girls were flirty, or Eddie Van Halen was gonna get dirty, and someone was gonna get very, very hurty. If the venue fucked up one little thing, then a light could fall and squash somebody flatter than a deaf kid in a train yard, and generally speaking, that is frowned upon. This isn't Looney Tunes. His head wouldn't just get a boner and some stars around it, okay? There's a thing dictionary companies do to make sure that people don't just take their dictionary, slap a different name on it, and pass it off as their own creation. They actually add fake words to their books to catch those dirty little definition thieves red-handed. Words like cock and balls in your initiatory. Adjective. Describes the feeling that you get when someone is giving you a fake piece of information that they just made up as an example, combined with the realization that you are in fact gay. If the company finds another dictionary with that fake word in it, then they know for a fact that that low down dirty definition dealer is skimming their shit and can slap them with a suit. This is related, I, I promise. To make sure these venues were reading their Chinese yellow pages down to the T, to, uh, to, the, to the Mr. T, Van Halen snuck a sneaky little clause into the munchies section of their concert rider. One bowl of M&Ms. Warning, absolutely no brown ones. This served to provide a very noticeable indicator to the band that the venue they're performing at is either on top of their shit or full of it. No brown M&Ms? Great, enjoy the chocolate, it's time to rock. Yes brown M&Ms? Fuck, the stage is about to be 9-11. Time to completely destroy this dressing room, which is exactly what they did at a concert for a Colorado college in 1980. They went backstage, found a brown M&M, kicked over tape shat on the floor, etc. They then went out to perform, and their suspicions proved correct when the stage collapsed, causing $80,000 worth of damages. Fun stuff. Good, family-friendly, fun stuff. Now let's talk about the time Eddie Van Halen drove a tank through Beverly Hills to point a gun at Fred Durst's head. <laughs> It's 2001, and critically unacclaimed self-described butt rock group Limp Biscuit is looking for a new guitarist. I don't know what happened to the old one. He got too firm for their biscuit. I guess. Could this be Eddie Van Halen's big break into the music business? No, that's retarded. But apparently he was introduced to Soft Pastry's lead singer Fred Durst by a record executive at a party after those auditions. The suit said Eddie and Durst should work together, to which Durst replied, That would be hilarious. The greatest guitar player ever plays with the worst band ever. Which like, yeah, <laughs> facts. That would be awesome. I hate Limp Biscuit, but I love that their lead singer actively knows that they suck and they call themselves butt rock. It would almost make me like them if they didn't sound like this. Despite this, Van Halen was actually DTF for some reason, and went over to Durst's place to have a jam sesh. And in true Van Halen style, Ed whipped up to the crib with his own guitars, amps, nine 18 wheelers, a rhinoceros probably. He brought a lot of shit, is what I'm getting at. And they were jamming, you know, they were diddling and doodling all over the place, but then suddenly, some heathen started smoking weed. Good heavens. Van Halen just could not take this act of illegality for some reason, and stormed off in a huff, leaving his guitars, amps, and rhinoceros behind. Which is honestly the weirdest part of this whole story to me. Like, you are an international rock star who's probably engaged in every dirty little deed under the sun, but you draw the line at somebody else smoking the devil's lettuce? That just doesn't add up to me. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't get it. Either way, the rock legend still wasn't vibing at the Biscuit household before that incident, describing the experience as feeling like a scholar among kindergartners. Tough. But fair. The next day, a butthurt Van Halen awoke from a long night of praising the Lord and fearing marijuana, and called Durst to try and get his shit back. After he had left Van Halen on red for more than a day, Eddie decided that it was time to pay Fred a visit. Author Andrew Bennett, a man who spent a considerable amount of time with Eddie and penned his quasi-biography, recounts the incident here. Eddie once bought an assault vehicle from a military auction. It has a shine gun mount on the back and is not legal. Eddie drove that assault vehicle through LA into Beverly Hills, then parked and left it running on the front lawn of the house Limp Biscuit was rehearsing in. He got out wearing no shirt, his hair in a samurai bun on top of his head, his jeans held up with a strand of rope and combat boots held together by duct tape. And he had a gun in his hand. That asshole answered the door, Bennett recalled Van Halen explaining. I put my gun to that stupid fucking red hat of his and I said, where's my shit, motherfucker? That fucking guy just turned to one of his employees and starts yelling at him to grab my shit. Bennett says, 
Eddie Van Halen stood on the front lawn of a residential home in Beverly Hills in broad daylight, smoking a cigarette while holding a gun on Fred Durst as he went back and forth from the house to the assault vehicle, lugging amps and guitars. And I really think that that is just despicable on Van Halen's part. Such an inconsiderate, disrespectful, and egregious act. I mean, smoking a cigarette? In broad daylight? In full view of possible children? Possible ethnic children, even? Maybe? Polluting the airways of our country's young minds with stinky tar and toxic nicotine? I mean, geez, you know, some people just deserve to be shot. And Fred Durst is one of those people, Eddie should have done it. While you might not want to find M&Ms that are brown in your bowl, you might not want to find James Brown in there either. Both because he is a clinically insane, PCP-smoking, armed and dangerous human being, but also just because, like, gross. <laughs> What are you doing in my bowl of M&M's, James Brown? Get out of there. I mean, is he naked? Is he clothed? I don't want this. Those are my tasty little treats. Get out of my bowl of M&M's, James Brown. PCP possession, evading police, assault and battery with intent to kill, and generally being mid. These are all things that James Brown has been convicted of in the country that he is so proud to be living in. How did all of this trouble begin? Living in America. And on September 24th, 1988, the so-called hardest twerking man in show business would participate in all of those activities at the same time. That afternoon, James Brown walked into an insurance seminar happening at the office next to his high as balls on PCP and committed an act that I will briefly depict here. Who the fuck is using my toilet? Y'all are all talking loud and saying nothing. Now stop shitting in my goddamn office. Just please, please, please get on the good foot and get up off of that thing. Papa don't take no mess. I'm in a cold sweat, okay? Try me. I'll go crazy. I don't want nobody to give me nothing except to take their hot pants off my cold porcelain, okay? I got a feeling that it's too funky in here. I can't stand myself. I am bewildered. I got ants in my pants. I'm feeling super bad. Parts one, two, and three. It's a man's world and I'm the boss. Now give it up or turn it loose before I get ready for the big payback and turn this gun into your licking stick, god damn it. Stop shitting in my toilet! Apparently James had caught one too many insurance brokers sneaking a quick dookie in his home bowl, and he was not gonna stand for any more secretive salacious stool splashing, swimming, and sitting soundly in his super special shitter. So he thought to himself, So I pull out my gun! Specifically his shotgun, after which he burst into the insurance meeting wildly waving it around and unintelligibly screaming something about bathrooms and Papa having a brand new bag, before police arrived and he fled into the truck that he had parked outside. He then led police on a high-speed interstate car chase, leaving Georgia and entering South Carolina, before realizing that he must have left his PCP in his other pants and turning around to head home. After pulling the UE, skirting around a police barricade, and unsuccessfully trying to ram two cop cars, the police shot out three of Brown's tires, the rims of which he continued to drive on for six miles until he, similar to his career, crashed violently into a ditch. Six miles on three rims is pretty impressive. You know, we've all played GTA, that shit is hard. Brown was then arrested, taken into the station, allegedly just punched directly in the face by a cop, booked and then convicted three months later to a six-year prison sentence. He got out three years later because despite being black in the 80s, he was still incredibly rich. He used the Michael Jackson method of evading punishment. Except Mike took it a little, a little bit further. James then proceeded to live the rest of his life in relative peace and harmony, never returning to his crazy car chase antics again. Until he did. <laughs> Like, the exact same, the exact same fucking thing. Seven years later, in 1998, James got into yet another high-speed car chase with the police after they were dispatched to his ranch to investigate a domestic violence situation. Which he did a lot. He's, he's he, a real piece of shit. James responded to the police showing up by firing his rifle into the air for funsies, hopping into his truck, and yet again speeding away from the police. Was he driving a stolen Lincoln Continental? And did he crash it into the swimming pool of a Holiday Inn? Well, the story was behind a paywall on the New York Times website, so I, I actually don't know, but 
Uh, it's, it's unlikely, but I do know who definitely did crash a Lincoln Continental into the swimming pool of a Holiday Inn. Board certified dickhead and drummer for the Who. Oh wait, I already did him. We've all had an affair with our mistress while the mother of our child was listening in through the baby monitor. Sorry, what I meant to say was, we've all done strange things after a bad breakup. Ate an entire pizza, ate an entire carton of ice cream, ate the asses of the entire Houston Astros 1994 lineup, uh, worn a hoodie when it's hot outside. That last one's a little too crazy for me personally. But what Billy Idol did after his bad breakup may have been just a little bit crazier. Possibly somewhere between that and wearing shorts in the snow. It's 1988, and the mother of Billy's child had just broken up with him after hearing him have an affair with his mistress through the baby monitor. Billy was sad, he was regretful, but most of all, he was horny, so he grabbed his friend Harry Johnson and headed to Thailand for a quote-unquote sexcation. I don't really know how I feel about the concept of sex addiction, but if your partner just caught you with another woman over the baby monitor for your child and your immediate response is to go on a Taiwanese sexcation, uh, it might be time to seek some professional help, compadre. Also, uh, Harry Johnson? Harry Johnson. There's no way that's a real name. That makes me feel like this guy was just a figment of Billy's superhumanly horny imagination. He's like the pornographic version of Tyler Durden in Fight Club. So Billy and Harry touch down in Bangkok to bang some cock into as many Taiwanese prostitutes as possible, just racking up STDs like their Xbox achievements on Bill and Harry's sexcellent adventure. I wonder what kind of gamer score hepatitis would get you. This trip had no rules, except for one rule, which of course is that there are no rules, except that there actually was a rule, and that rule is no drugs. Bill and Harry were trying to steer clear of the no-no powder by sticking to more wholesome, family-oriented things like Hennessy and hookers. That was seriously the plan. They were gonna try and not do drugs by drinking and fucking so much that they just simply would not have time to snort, shoot, or schneef any illicit substances. Substances. And I can proudly say that today, I do not freebase cocaine. So obviously this plan worked, and the pair did not consume even a smidgen of schmack until less than a week later when they got bored and asked their cab driver if he had a coke plug. Now I'll do some toot now, don't get me, I will do some toot, you know. He hit him back with the Uno reverse card and said, well, do you have a coke plug? Yes you do, it's me, here is your cocaine. <laughs> However, this cab driver must have either been the worst drug dealer in the world or an incredibly committed Pulp Fiction fan because what he ended up giving these guys was pure China white heroin. You may be wondering at this point, how does the president of Cambodia fit into all of this? Oh, uh, you weren't wondering that? That, ha that had nothing to do with what I was talking about? Well, you should be. He's the president of Cambodia, for Christ's sakes. He's a very important world figure, and you are being very inconsiderate of his feelings right now. After Bill and Harry had spent an entire week in the presidential suite, mail-ordering prostitutes, shooting heroin that they had heated in candy wrappers from the hotel minibar, and generally acting like Charlie Sheen in the mid-2000s, how do Especially you... when you see how I party, man. It was epic. The run I was on made Sinatra, Flynn, Jagger, Richards, all of them just look like, you know, droopy-eyed, armless children. The hotel was like, hey, listen, uh, President of Cambodia is coming, so uh, y'all gotta move. And they were like, no. And the hotel was like, what? You're in the presidential suite. He is literally a president. Get out of there. And they were like, nah. And the hotel was like, bruh. And, and they just stayed in there. Fuck the president of Cambodia, I guess. He, he's gonna have to stay at a Motel 6. So week two rolls around, and who do you think finds Billy Idol passed out on heroin in the elevator with the doors opening and closing onto his legs? You guessed it, legendary Jew-hating racist Mel Gibson finds Billy Idol passed out on heroin in the elevator with the doors opening and closing on his legs. How cute is that? I assume Billy wasn't a big Braveheart fan, because after that, he and Harry headed off for a brief B-plot in Southern Thailand land where they crashed a couple of jet skis and threw a five-foot log through a glass hotel room door before returning to the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok. Over the course of the next week, Billy caused $250,000 worth of damage to the place, to which the hotel, much like Donald Trump in 2017 when he couldn't open a pickle jar, called in the military. That's right, Billy Idol was causing so much damage that they had to send in the Taiwanese army to detain him. 
They entered the room, shot him with a tranquilizer dart like he was Alex from Madagascar, loaded him onto a gurney, and wheeled him right the fuck out of the country. Billy woke up vomiting at the airport and about to board a plane back to LA. Which is understandable. I would probably also be vomiting if I found out I was about to board a plane to LA. Huh, avocado toast. Never rains. But at least Billy had fun in Thailand. And you know who else has a lot of fun in Thailand? And you know who was a pedophile? I know, this was a pretty hard pill for me to swallow too. I mean, David Bowie looks like he would still somehow get child molested well into his 30s, but unfortunately it's true. Also, c can we just take a second and look at this man? Hot take, and I know you all hate me for it, but uh, David Bowie is one of the ugliest men that I have ever laid eyes on. His face is weird, his lips are non-existent, I can literally see through him, he is so white. This man has never heard of melanin in his life. Okay, I guess I'm on that same boat with him, with that one, but I, I don't know. Man, he just makes me physically uncomfortable to look at. He he looks like a baby bird that fell out of the nest and is hungry for my worms, bro. And look at his eyes. D do it. Look at them. They're not two different colors like people say they are. They're crazy person eyes. His left iris is paralyzed and refuses to contract ever. So now he's just half tripping all day long, looking like his doctor just died in the middle of his eye exam. Apparently, he stole somebody's girlfriend when he was 15 and got socked in the left eye so hard that it was like, ah, fuck it. I didn't sign up up for this shit, I give up. This wasn't in my contract, so I will no longer contract. And before you go in the comments, I'll like, David Bowie is my life. He's so hot, and when I was 12, he saved my dad from a forest fire by jizzing over the entirety of Appalachia. Remember, I did open this up with the fact that he's a pedophile. So... When Bowie was in his mid-twenties, he took the virginity of 14-year-old Lori Maddox, a famous groupie from the 70s who attests to this day that the act was very much consensual on her part. Uh, well, I assume it would be on his part as well. It'd be a pretty big stretch if he was like this 14-year-old molested me. <laughs> and not that her saying it's consensual makes it okay, obviously. I'm just establishing that that is like her thing. She's into older famous men, okay? Bowie was found to be strongly linked to several of these so-called baby groupies which is probably the most disgusting term I have ever heard. Apparently these underage groupies were pretty common in 1970s Los Angeles, giving me yet another reason to aggressively vomit before boarding a plane there. Of all the baby groupies at the time, Lori Maddox was the most well known, and pretty immediately after she let the Rocket Man blast off, she started hooking up with satanic guitarist Lori began dating Paige while she was still 14, and their relationship was a bit more involved than a quickie bust from Ziggy Stardust. And while Jimmy Page didn't want to stop being a disgusting, underage sex haver man, he also didn't want to, you know, uh, go to jail. So because of this, he went to great lengths to hide the fact that he was regularly humping somebody who was probably skipping their 8th grade geometry class. When he took her on tour, she was kept locked in a hotel room, constantly protected by one of the band's bodyguards, until he a year later, when Paige was like, well, I really didn't want anyone to find out that I was dating a 14-year-old because, you know, that would be awful. But now she's 15, so that's fine. What I'm doing is totally chill now. They'll, they'll totally understand. And after that, he just took her with him everywhere and didn't even try to hide the fact that he was regularly humping somebody who was now skipping their ninth grade geometry class. Lori and Jimmy broke up when she turned 16 and caught him in bed with somebody else. Hopefully, someone at least close to his own age for a change. I did some more research after writing that. It wasn't. Finding out some of these rockers did stuff like this was sadly not really that surprising but was still information that I didn't really want to know. I mean, I can't listen to these guys the same again. I just have Michael Jackson syndrome for all of them now, which sucks because, I, you know, I really like the band Jimmy Page played for. I don't know if you've heard of them. They were kind of a small group. They're actually called... And I'll talk about the rest of them in a second, but I'm not done with Jimmy yet. But how, you ask? You've already established that he's a gross underage sex haver, and it can't get any worse from there, right? 
right? So if you saw the Keith Moon video, you might recall that the drummer for The Who just loved to dress up like a Nazi for some reason. And I don't know what it is about rock stars thinking anti-Semitism is a fashion statement, but Jimmy was not only a pedophile, uh, he also loved to hit the Heil. One of the band's other groupies reported that every city the band visited in the mid-70s, Jimmy would get decked out in full Nazi regalia and head to the nearest gay bar to do heroin in the bathroom with drag queens. And honestly, I think he just misunderstood what drag was. Now, if he threw some fake titties and a plump badonkadonk in the Hitler costume, I'm there for it, but I just think he couldn't grasp the concept, I guess. So it's no surprise to anyone that rock stars love destroying hotels, just ask the Thai military, but Led Zeppelin loved to destroy one thing in particular in the rooms they stayed at the TVs, specifically by throwing them out of the window. I guess that was more entertaining than whatever PBS was playing at the time. I get it. I mean, I've definitely considered doing it a time or two as a kid after seeing too many pillow pet commercials interrupt my eye Carly. Probably fuck. <laughs> Even the band's manager got in on the action. After the Zeppelin members checked into a hotel and destroyed five TVs in one night, a young clerk at the front desk informed the manager that he was going to have to pay them $2,500 for damages. Not that much for them. Really. After getting the money, the clerk got a little curious and asked the manager, I've heard that Led Zeppelin has a reputation for throwing TVs, but I thought it was all BS. Can you tell me, what does it feel like to just toss a TV out of your window? The manager responded, Kid, there's some things in life that you've just got to experience for yourself. He gave the guy $500 and said, Here you go, mate. Go toss a TV, courtesy of Led Zeppelin. Oh boy! I found $500. He found it! Oh my god! Run home! Reception desk guy. Run as fast as you can! Led Zeppelin once got permanently banned from Seattle's Edgewater Inn for antics like this, but that didn't stop them from going back later and checking into a room under fake names. Which, like, um, how did that work? These guys are internationally recognizable rock stars who were already banned for life from this specific hotel, and the front desk guy was just like, Alrighty, here you go, Mr. Fake Namenstein. Enjoy your stay. The Continental Breakfast is at 9 o'clock, and would you like your TV bolted or unbolted from the wall? Uh, we we'll take unbolted, please. Can do. Like, how did they pull that off? Uh, did they just slap on some fake mustaches and hop on top of each other in a trench coat like the little rascals? However they did it, they got in and proceeded to engage in the act that the band is probably the most known for, the Mud Shark Incident. So the Edgewater Inn was special because, as the name implies, it was on the edge of the water. Because of this, if you were in the right room, you could just put a worm on a hook and just fish right out the window. Look, here's the Beatles doing it. Wow. The story goes that after a long day of window fishing, the gang eventually caught a mud shark, and together with a band by the name of Vanilla Fudge, they proceeded to do, um, things with it. Things that are not uh, typically done with marine life. Allegedly, the band got an apparently willing, red-headed female participant, strapped her to the bed, and proceeded to, uh, put the shark in, um, places. All of the places that you're thinking of. It ain't called a mud shark for nothing. Throughout my life, a lot of people ask me, Evan, uh, where did the band Led Zeppelin get their name from? To which I would normally respond with, uh, who are you? How did you get in my house? Followed by, why are you asking me that? What are you doing? Oh no, not the mud shark. Please not the mud shark, Jimmy. Oh no. But since you're asking so nicely and I don't smell an overwhelming musk of fish and lube slowly approaching from behind me, I will answer your query. In 1966, Jimmy Page got the name while recording some songs with another group popular at the time. When he talked about forming his own band, the drummer from the other band said, yeah, that would go over like a lead balloon. <laughs> Page liked the joke, but apparently the lead balloons was already taken, so he had to settle on Led Zeppelin. A real shame. A real lost opportunity there. And oh yeah, the band he was singing with was this little group called The Who, and the guy who made the lead balloon joke was actually... Oh wait... Kill John Lennon! I already did. Kill John Keith Richards may have been a rolling stone, but he was also a rolling crazy person who once threatened to stab Donald Trump. And before that was even like a trendy thing to do, either. 
truly ahead of its time. It was 1989, and the Stones were still rolling all the way into the Money Pit. It's the end of their Steel Wheels tour, and the gang thought to themselves, hmm, this incredibly successful tour was great and all, but... How can we have even more money than the massive amount that we already have? They decided to do a pay-per-view concert, knowing that everyone would want to view, but must also, by law, pay. You know, as a kid, I thought it was pay-per-view, like, like you view paper, uh, because children are worthless, sticky idiots who should just drink their chalky milk and shut up. The only issue with this capitalist caper is the only venue the Stones could find to do this show at was Donald Trump's hotel and casino in Atlantic City. Typically, that would be fine, a little ritzy even, but Keith Richards explained to the rest of the band that he hated Donald Trump more than AIDS and cancer and herpes and smallpox and Amy Schumer in Los Angeles, and he would rather die of AIDS and cancer and herpes and smallpox and Amy Schumer in Los Angeles than be in the same room with him. But the band did end up agreeing to play on one condition. Donald Trump had to keep his bloated, orange basketball of a body away from Keith Richards at all costs. He wasn't allowed to watch the show and wasn't even allowed in the hotel at all. So naturally, Trump w went to the hotel and he made up a bunch of overblown excuses as to why it's absolutely necessary he be there. Oh yes, my steaks are here. I need my steaks. They're the biggest steaks, let me tell you. I heard China was here. I need to be here because of China. I forgot my tanning spray. I'm starting to molt. I have the biggest, most best molting of anyone you've ever seen. So much molting, so much more than Ted Cruz. Keith gets word of this and calls the manager, who was the one responsible for cock-blocking Trump from entering the premises, back into the dressing room for a little one-on-one -on -one chat. The manager recalls, They call me back, at which point Keith pulls out his knife, slams it on the table and says, What the hell do I have you for? Do I have to go over there and fire him myself? One of us is leaving the building, either him or us. The manager manager tells Trump, scat, vamoose, get out of here you filthy animal, be gone satanic demon, the power of Keith compels you. And Trump is like, okay, I'm leaving now, but not because Keith Richards threatened to end my life, okay, I have the best life, very big life, and I'm choosing to leave now on my own accord, I just remembered China's actually in China right now, so I have to leave because of China, okay? And Keith Richards unfortunately went on to play the show and never stabbed the future 45th president in the United States. The end of that bit. Robin Williams once described Keith Richards as the only man who can make the Osbournes look fucking Amish. And while I don't think he's quite as crazy as the Prince of Darkness, uh, when Mrs. Doubtfire says something like that, you listen. So let's talk about the time he snorted his own dead father's ashes. I think one of the articles I read while researching this video puts it pretty well. Scientists are still desperately trying to formulate a substance that Keith Richards hasn't already shoveled up his hoover in large quantities, but the revelation in 2007 that he'd ingested his own dad made front page headlines. In that 2007 interview, Keith was asked what the strangest drug he's ever taken was, and his response was this. The strangest thing I've tried to snort, my father. I snorted my father. He was cremated, and I couldn't resist grinding him up with a little bit of blow. My dad wouldn't have cared. He didn't give a shit. It went down pretty well, and I'm still alive. Alive? Yes. Now possessed with the eternal grieving soul of Papa Richards? Also, yes. There's a saying that goes, after the apocalypse, the only things that will survive are cockroaches and Keith Richards. Which, of course, we all know is undeniably true, but he did come close to death on December 3rd, 1965. The Rolling Stones were playing a song ironically titled The Last Time, and Keith gave a particularly electrifying performance when his guitar touched his mic stand and he was electrified so aggressively that a flame shot out of his guitar and he was shot backwards a la Marty in Back to the Future. Great Scott! He was immediately rendered unconscious, and many had thought he had been shot. Like, 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 like with a gun. While Keith was in the hospital, he heard a doctor say with no context, well, they either wake up or they don't, which he found so funny that he decided to, in fact, stay alive. It's hypothesized that the shock didn't kill him because of the thick rubber-soled shoes he was wearing at the time. Turns out the only medical attention he really needed was from Doc Martin. Keith always looked up to blues musician Chuck Berry, crediting him as the man who inspired him to pick up a guitar in the first place. Chuck! Chuck! It's Marvin! Your cousin, Marvin Berry! You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this! 
One night, though, he decided to pick up the wrong guitar when he found himself alone in Chuck's dressing room next to the artist's axe. He picked it up and started playing before Chuck Berry came in the dressing room, saw what Keith was doing, and punched him in the face, giving him a black eye. Keith described it as one of Chuck's greatest hits. Flash forward to Keith at a golf course in the early morning, something that only happens when he has stayed awake so long that it is now the early morning. He grabs a plate and decides to sit out by the golf course to enjoy some Eggs Benedict. Meanwhile, Bobby Keys, a jazz man, happened to be playing golf at the very same course. He made a very unfortunate shot, making a hole-in-one directly onto Keith's Eggs Benny. Keith was displeased. As any patriotic American would do when angry at something, Keith immediately pulled out his gun and shot the golf ball. He then locked eyes with Bobby and screamed, That's a 10 stroke fucking penalty and if you ever do it again I'll do the same to you. You ruined my fucking breakfast! While a world famous rock musician popping a cap in his balanced breakfast is not exactly what you would expect at the golf course, there is someone who pulled a stunt at a golf course somehow even more unusual. Guitarist for Guns N' Roses and weird name haver, but to find out what it was, stay tuned for part two.